Hi, welcome to Talking Books and Stuff, the program that talks all about books and writing and stuff. Here's your host, Dennis Rimmer. Here we are, another edition. This is Talking Books and Writing and Stuff. Today we're talking about books and writing and research and railroads with uh, Stephen R. Bown. We've had um, Mr. Bown on before uh, talking about the Hudson Bay Company in uh, the book about the Hudson Bay Company, which was a wonderful read, and I hope you have uh, picked it up and uh, added it to your collection. And now we have another one, a new one. It is Dominion, the Railway and the rise of Canada. So, uh, Stephen, thank you again for joining us for a little chit-chat here. Oh, yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the offer. It's great, and uh, we'll just jump right in. Uh, The book is called Dominion, the Railway and the Rise of Canada. Railway is hard for me to say. Um, Why this book, and why now? Why did you think this was an important topic to tackle? Oh, I mean... You know, at the end of my last book on the Hudson's Bay Company, I, I, I kind of quickly wrapped it up with the formation of Canada as a country and the decline of the fur trade. Uh, but obviously the, the story wasn't, there was no real end there other than the fur trade ending. The next big thing that happened in Canadian history was the very fact of Canada's existence and the need for a railway to bring this country, uh, you know, in a more physical sense to create the country. And... You know, the CPR is one of the great romantic stories in Canadian history, it's sort of an iconic tale of how the nation was built. And, um, you know, I think it's fairly, you know, no one could really challenge it. It's the single most important piece of civic infrastructure in Canada's history that has enabled us to exist as an independent country from the United States. And it was such a turbulent time period and so much was going on in the world <clears throat> and in Western Canada particularly at that time, that it's uh, it's laid the foundation for, well, the creation of the country, but a, a lot of the issues that are the country is dealing with uh, to this very day had their origins at that time period. And uh, this book obviously um, entails lots of research, so uh, how do you find out all of this stuff that goes on behind the scenes and names and dates and places that... Uh, heretofore I'd never even heard of so yeah I mean <laughs> it's really I mean you can go and read I, I always start you know with just a general knowledge of some of the older stories but you know Pierre Burton's famous book on the railways published in 19, 1970 so you know a lot has happened in the world over the last 50 some years since those books were first published and a lot of new information or research has come out or, uh, you know, there's a, the capacity for broadening the story to include the lives of a whole series of people who wouldn't normally find themselves in one of the older, broader stories about the railway, you know, presented itself. You know, for example, there's, there's you know, the discovered diary of one of the Ch- Chinese uh, labor who worked upon the railway in British Columbia. Before this time, you know, it was called the Diary of Duke Sang Wong. Before this, there was no uh, single person of Chinese origin who left any written record. A lot of them were literate, literate uh, you know, peasants from China who brought over. And it was really hard to find any knowledge or insight into how their lives were as they constructed the most dangerous, um, deadly part of the railway in British Columbia along the Fraser River Canyon where over 600 died on that one stretch from dynamite explosions and tunnel collapses or whatnot. So, you know, that's just one one example. Um, there's a lot of... If I... I wanted to just broaden the whole experience to, to rather than narrowly be focused on who was financing this, who was the... Which politician was in charge of making the key decisions? I wanted to include the stories of people whose lives were being lived within the context of this time and how they viewed the how they viewed the changing world and how the world changed them and how they you know made decisions based on this railway whether they worked for it or knew people who worked for it or just saw their lands changing because of the arrival of the railway all of this comes together 
And I think, um, you know, focusing too narrowly on just the narrow story of who financed and who built and who worked on the railway yeah, um, was missing half of the story. And so I just wanted to include the whole, um, the whole broad network of what was going on in the nation at that time. And the book begins, uh, one would think that the, a story about a railroad would begin in the east and go west, uh, but uh, because that's, you know, most of Canada at that time was in the east. Um, but the west, we had uh, Bigby and Douglas and uh, a chap by the name of Klatsassen. Um, what, how was he important to this whole story? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I made a deliberate decision not to start this story in the east and I wanted to start it in the west and and then go back to the east to show how these two disparate parts of the continent you know the Pacific from British Columbia ended up being connected and um, that led me to you know talk about the BC gold rush in 1858 a bit and and um, in the 1860s there was the first idea of building a road which would eventually have led to a railroad into the interior into the gold fields um, and this was done by the fellow named, oh no, like, I, anyway, I, I totally went blank on his name. Anyway, he, yep. Wadding, his name was Waddington. Waddington, Waddington, Waddington. and he wanted to, yeah, have... yeah, yeah, yeah. He came up from the U.S. and he wanted to build this road into the interior. And of course he was just, he didn't care who was there. He just said, I, I'm going to build it in from, you know, Butte Inlet, one of the inlets north of Vancouver along the Pacific coast. And he just started hiring his crews and bringing them in there and boasting and lying about how big it was going to be. And it was going to be this next big railroad. And he started charging that road and eventual railway right through the territory of the Chilcotin mm-hmm. peoples um, without asking them, without doing anything. And, of course, smallpox was being introduced. And smallpox was a devastating disease for all of the indigenous peoples at that time, period, along with tuberculosis and some other you know, illnesses from the prairies all the way out to the coast. Anyway... There was a devastating smallpox outbreak. The salmon harvest the previous fall had been very poor because so many people were sick, but there was widespread suffering and starvation in the land, and um, the survivors had this idea that all these problems were being brought in by these unwanted uh, road crews that were carving right to the center of the territory. Anyway, it ended up in a big financial, I mean, a a big violent resistance, which caused a financial... um, outlay by the new colony of British Columbia, which had to pay for for all of the, you know, posses that were tr- trying to keep some peace and the whole legal apparatus that was trying to control this territory over which they really had no control. But, you know, <laughs> dozens of people died and the uh, the, the cost of, of trying to maintain the peace with Clat Sasson, who was eventually captured and, and tried and hung for his so-called treason, although people these days wouldn't really call it a massacre, they would call it a, a war. You know, he was resisting the incursion into his territories. But anyway, this was so expensive to the colony of British Columbia that they were more or less teetering on the verge of bankruptcy. And that's one of the reasons they were being forced into joining Canada. That and the promise of an actual railroad which would be built somewhere else. But but yeah, I wanted to include you know, stories like that, Cloud Sasson and the Chilcotin War, just to show the context of the time. And it is dramatic, fascinating, fascinating stories. I mean, it's incredible just, uh, well, how truly unregulated the world was back then and how chaotic the time period was with, you know, diseases racking everything and violent uprisings and floods of tens of thousands of, of, uh, of uh, American, you know, miners and prospectors up into British Columbia. And later on the prairies, there was, after the American Civil War, there were a lot of sort of discharged war veterans who were sent out to the West. But, you know, they had no role to play in the Eastern economy. And they ended up coming up into the Canadian prairies and selling rock gut whiskey to right. indigenous peoples. And the result in the Cypress Hills Massacre, another, yep. another big... Uh, you know, dramatic incident of this around the same era, and it's um, it's just uh, amazing that uh, north of the forty ninth, there was we'll say nothing, <laughs> and like in eighteen sixty nine, the U.S. had completed the first their first coast to coast railway, the Union Pacific, and Canada was 
what two years old at the time so it it was a like you said a major undertaking that was about the only thing that would have enabled a country such as ours to exist is that basically the message that is i mean you know that there was no let's say the, the population of anything in the in the prairies in canada at that time was more or less uh you know people associated with the fur trade mm -hmm. some you know metis settlements around you know winnipeg what's now winnipeg which were starting to be involved in some farming the incursions of american whiskey traders um the population sort of a, a european style more settler population hadn't even been conceived in those regions yet it was indigenous uh, led nations pursuing their own political and economic objectives however you know, as I was mentioning with the disease and the economic dislocation from the the loss of the buffalo, oddly enough, it was the American Railway, which really precipitated the decline of the buffalo, which ended up causing a massive famine on the Canadian prairies as well. I mean, we've all heard of the Irish potato famine, but it's not so common knowledge, the, um, you know, the great Canadian buffalo famine, which was every bit as devastating and horrible, you know, to the people who had to survive through it. I mean, but it was the railway itself that brought in the different uh, culture and settlers of that land. But with 80, up to 80% of the population decline in indigenous populations, the land was, um, well, you can, can imagine the devastation if within a single generation, you know, at least half of the people you knew were dead. The economy collapsed, your food source collapsed, and there's a, uh, you know, a big railway being plowed across the land. Um, you know, this was devastating times for a lot of people. It's not directly related to the railway, but the railway was a metaphor for, you know, these ma mighty tectonic changes that were racking the Western North America in the late 19th century. And, um, yeah, the Canadian railway, you know, all of Western Canada would have become part of the United States if it wasn't for that railway, because there was no way to get from, you know, the eastern settlements around the St. Lawrence and the Pacific Coast, you know, Port Victoria and the Fraser River on the lower mainland of BC. Uh, the only way to travel between those two regions was for people in Victoria. They had to take a steamship south to California San Francisco, get on a steamship and ride the railway east in the United States and then come back up into Canada. Right. So you can see there's not, even BC would have just voted to join the U.S. if it wasn't for the promise of a railway. I mean, there's no communication between these regions. There, there was no physical way of getting there. I mean, it took over three months to, for people to travel just as far west as Winnipeg because <laughs> it's so hard to get through those regions so without without any kind of infrastructure the land couldn't really be claimed by any country of canada because well all the travel communication and economic links would have been north south and and of, of course the united states would have loved to have taken over that territory that was the era of manifest destiny you know what right that. so and uh, what we had was, uh, like you said, you point out the sort of the irony of having to travel through the U.S. from Western Canada, as it were, to <laughs> talk about join making a, a nation from coast to coast, which had to go through another country to even talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can see it doesn't take too much imagination to, uh, to foresee the future of that arrangement, right? Like, it, yeah. it would have all, you know, the Americans were very eager to just send up some branch lines from their own railway to the south um, and connect to the, you know, whatever economic regions that were developing in Canada at that time would have just been linked into the broader American cultural network. Um, and so, yeah, of course, the, the construction of the railway itself is, you know, setting aside the context of, of its need and the politics. I mean, the actual construction of the railway itself was just like staggering. It was the largest railway ever conceived and built at the time. The most sophisticated from an engineering point of view. Um, you know, that all that terrain that's north of Lake Superior is very unsuited to railways. The terrain to the south of Lake Superior is kind of flat, open land. 
which is why railways already existed there. But the, right. the Canadian part was all, it's all Canadian shield, it's solid granite with swamps and pools. I mean, and, and then, of course, the prairies was the easy part. Yeah, you had to build bridges and trestles going in all the coolies as it shot across the land. But then you hit the mountains in British Columbia. And how do you get over like, Ro- Ro- you know, Rogers Pass and Kicking Horse Pass and, you know, the canyons of the Fraser River? I mean, it was an engineering triumph. It was a political triumph. It was a financial triumph. It, like the involved 17,000 workers at one time, just constantly churning away. I mean, that was a huge number of people. Well, that would be a large number of people now even. No. But back then, that was a significant chunk of the economy it was was focused on this one objective. And of course, it's all it was all the objective of John, John A. McDonald's, his great sort of his dream was to create a country called Canada. And um, he was very anti-American. He didn't want American political dominance. And he spent his entire life trying to create Canada, which meant creating the railway as one of the, you know, the building blocks that would enable this country to exist. And then uh, the other forces that came into play at that time um, with the new technological developments, I'm, I'm specifically thinking of the dynamite right now. Ah. I mean, it only came in, it was only invented in 1867. I mean, <laughs> and that's, yeah, I mean, you think dynamite must have been around for, for ages, but no. no. 1867, Alfred Nobel, the, the well, founder then, of the Nobel Prizes. Right. Yep. And so we've got dynamite blasting these rocks and 17,000 people you talk about on the workforce and the, uh, they were, a lot of them were exploited, as you say, right? Especially the Chinese workers, they didn't get paid as much, and their conditions, um, to say the least, were horrible. Uh, and yet still the whole project uh, took a while. A typical Canadian project, there was delays, cost overruns, greed, etc. Everything. <laughs> yeah. And it's still yeah. going on today. We can't do anything. How come we can't do anything today, and yet we could 150 <laughs> years ago? I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, it's a valid, it's a valid question. I have been thinking about it. Like, well, I mean, p- part of the reason is back then there were no labor regulations, there were no environmental considerations, and any issues with the First Nations land were taken over by the federal government with those negotiated treaties. So you know, the numbered treaties, which were all done in the seventeen seventy. Um, yeah, 1870s, sorry. Right. And, you know, the, these days everything's far more complex than that. Um, you could not, workers would, would not live, it would be completely illegal for them to live the way that, you know, any of the work camps were. Even the good ones, which, you know, on the prairies, that's, if you got to work on the railway in the prairies, that was the, the cream puff jobs. <laughs> I mean, they were decently paid, run by Cornelius Van Horn himself. You know, he was the Chicago Rail uh, mastermind. He was brought up to Montreal and then or to be the head of the CPR to see it through to completion. He personally took over that and he he had a great love of food. He was a large (laughs) man and he loved eating and he made sure that all of his workers had good food every single day. Simple food because there was no electricity and no industrial farming at the time, but quantity. They had proper food in other places where different contractors were hired. That was not the case. Um, a lot of them lived in horrible conditions. You know, I'm thinking north of Lake Superior where it's like minus 30 degrees and they're living in these little tents. I mean, the only reason they stayed working there is the CPR refused to transport them out oh. and said, well, you can stop working for us, but we're not shipping you out until the spring. <laughs> so you might as well keep working because otherwise you have to pay us room and board. <laughs> you know, these workers were essentially captured there yep. and they had no alternative but to continue working under those conditions. Um, in British Columbia, it was the, you know, a lot, of, a lot of that was Irish or French workers or even some Italians in the northern north of Lake Superior. Uh, out in the BC, of course, there were, you know, workers, a lot of Americans, some of the gold miners took on some of those jobs, just a general sort of mixed European-ish type workforce. But the the hardest, most dangerous jobs were taken over by these uh, Chinese, I call them the, you know, the temporary foreign workers of the 1880s. I mean, China at that time was undergoing 
you know, massive upheaval. There was famine, there was civil war, there was um, disease across the land. There was a huge Chinese diaspora around the world at that time, and they were labor brokers in Canton were shipping them out all over the place. And they essentially built railways and did mining jobs all around the world. And the ones that came to Canada, of course, predominantly ended up on the railway. Um, they were paid less, a third less. Whether I'm sure they didn't want to be paid a third less. Just they, they were mostly illiterate peasants. None of them could read or, or write or communicate and unspoken any English. They relied on their labor brokers to have arranged Ah. <laughs> Hello? Existing in the province who felt they would be depressed, put a depression on wage demands, and, you know, which is, you know, probably true. And uh, a anyway, the, these people just uh, were not even, they had, how would they even communicate? I mean, there was not, there was right. no one within their group who could interact with the larger community on any great level. And so they lived isolated in their own work camps where they supplied their own cooks and did their own cooking. There wasn't even medical facilities or medical treatment supplied to them. So many of them succumbed to injuries and malnutrition and horrible living conditions. I mean, there were some, you know, dramatic stories of some, di some of the dynamite blasting along those canyons where people would be lowered down on a rope tied around their waist into the rock area below where they would put dynamite in the crack and light it and then, you know, yank on the rope or yell to be pulled up quickly before the thing exploded. Before the thing blew up. Oh, no. That's great. Yeah. So yeah. You, you can see how that's not going to result in a good outcome. No. So, you know, <laughs> you know, 600 died along that one stretch of, you know, one stretch of the railway, 100 kilometers or so, like, just trying to get through There's There is no place to build a road or a railway. They had to blast it. And the tunnels were collapsing and the rocks were collapsing and the industrial accidents. Cause everything, keep in mind when they talk about horsepower, <laughs> back then it was actually horses. Right. You know, there was teams of oxen and horses were doing most of the labor and the hauling. And it was all manual labor with pickaxes and shovels. And, um, this is primitive work conditions. And, uh, so obviously today people can't live like that. There's no, there's no way we would allow that. And and the, you know, it could take ten years of of consultations to to help plan a route from an environmental point of view. Which rivers are going to be crossed? Is the blasting going to destroy the the salmon runs or contaminate or pollute different rivers? I mean, and then there's the indigenous peoples who would want to say, and we're where a road or railway would be going. I mean, this our, our society is so much more complex right now. But the great irony is that our society has become complex and become wealthy because of the existence of this railway, which was, you know, built and constructed. Well, it was a disaster for some, for a lot of people. Yep. I mean, even, even while others who worked on it took a great pride in their contribution to this creation of it right but but i mean there is an irony there that uh this piece of infrastructure constructed quite literally sometimes with the lives of the workers and um with the opposition of many of the indigenous peoples who lived you know along where its general route was going um has resulted in a country you know that we have one of the best living standards in the world mm -hmm. and we have institutions that have allowed for reasonably peaceful change over time without resorting to the, the extreme violence in so many other places. So, you know, you yeah. got to let that sit a little bit sometimes, right? The, yeah. the irony of it all. <laughs> now, was there any, uh, a fascinating, the most fascinating uh, fact you uncovered in your research? Was there anything that really stood out or struck you as, holy smokes, I didn't know this was going on. <laughs> well, I mean, we did talk a little bit about some of these, these things. I mean, he, here's a couple, though. I mean, um, well, one was the discovery of this diary that gave a real insight into how the, the Chinese workers lived on the CPR. There was none before, and I was talking to a fellow on an American um, railway blog just recently. He said there's none in the U.S. either. So, uh -huh. you know, that is quite surprising, and it's a very insightful writer and an observer of the world, and, you know, I was so happy to find that it was only the last three years ago that it was that it was found too. But other things, I mean, here's just a little 
uh, a little tidbit of information I came upon. Um, it just kind of reveals that Canada was not as sort of static and uniform a place as it is sometimes assumed. Um, I think sometimes people have a view of history that they think, oh, the world is now and it's changing and it's dynamic. And, and then there's this thing that they call the past. Mm-hmm. And the past is like a, an old black and white photograph, and it never changes, and it just sits there. There's right. a lot of bad things happen, and, you know, and they don't ever account for change over time or the fact that the dominant narrative, by by virtue of being <laughs> dominant and running out of time, failed to appreciate a whole bunch of the little things happening. And um, here's just one small example: a fellow named Mifflin Wistar Gibbs, a black American business leader, in you know, and <clears throat> led over 600 black pioneers to Victoria, up from California, after the gold rush, after 1858. And he brought them, and they settled there. They were they were against some of the laws that were going to prevent them from being able to vote in California at that time. And they ended up settling all around Victoria. That's a lot of people. Yeah, Victoria was a small place at that time. Yep. And he became one of the most respected people around, and he was a member of the Confederation League which was the group of people arguing that British Columbia should join with Canada rather than with the United States. <laughs> um, so, wow. you know, that, it's a funny little story. It's obviously not a directly related to the railway, but I include a bunch of little, uh, just a little aside stories like that that feed into the bigger river just to give a sense of, of uh, who was around at that time and what was the world like. Right. And, uh, you know, it's, it was as dynamic and exciting a time as any time in history. It wasn't static, and it wasn't exactly what we think it was. There was all kinds of things happening. Stephen R. Baum is with us. The book is Dominion, about building the CPR, Canadian Pacific Railway. A couple more questions uh, before I have to wrap this up. Uh, first, is there... Sir John A. Macdonald's been in the news lately, of course, with changing opinions. Is there a legacy, a something we can... Uh, truly say that the, the railway wouldn't have happened without him? Is that true? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, he he is a controversial figure these days. Um, I do think some of the controversy associated with him is, mis, is misplaced. When you look at the records, um, he's often blamed for um, residential schools and the horrors associated with that. But he, it's important to keep in mind, he died in 1891. Most of these residential schools were built and expanded under the Wilfrid Laurier government, which came out afterwards, you know, later in the 1890s, which isn't to try and uh, put a, you know, two, it's not trying to whitewash his reputation, but just to say that everything bad from that era often seems to be heaped onto his sh- shoulders as a convenient uh, scapegoat, maybe. And uh, when you look at it, he's not entirely responsible for all of those bad things that happened. Right. Um, and But he did, you know, speaking to his positive contribution, there would be no Canada without him. Canada was his, his baby. I mean, he, he dreamed it. He made the Eastern one happen. He spent his whole life fighting for it to get together. And the idea of it extending to the Pacific was is just hit him. He wanted it. He fought for it. He didn't want Americans. He was very anti-American. He wanted something that was associated with the British Empire. For him, that was his big goal in life. And it would not exist without him. The railway was a means to an end because it was the Rail Rebellion, the first one in 1870, whether you call it a rebellion or resistance or uprising or whatever, highlighted the need that if he was going to claim those lands, you know, he had to somehow find a way of getting there. It took the troops that he sent out to, to deal with that uprising in 1870. It took him 96 days of hard travel to, just, just to get to Winnipeg. So, he, <laughs> you know, and it, you can't have a country if that's how it's going to be run, right? So right. he knew then that that's what the idea of the railway came. It became like, oh, we need to have a way to get there or that land is going to become American. So that's all John A. McDonald. He caused it all. He created it all. He conceived it all. Um, there was a lot of corruption, there was a lot of insider knowledge, there was lots of, you know, sleazy undertakings, which are kind of amusing from our current point of view, because it highlights how little has changed in yeah. in politics, right. you know, but, uh, yeah. That, and 
just before the book of course is dominion uh by stephen r bound about the building of the cpr and more than just building a railway it's building a country and the the good the bad and the indifferent that went with it just one more to, to wrap it up tell them early in the book we find out these people uh who are heading west uh had a great <coughs> excuse me a great meal because somebody cooked up skunk so, oh, yeah. How can like you have put, a good meal of skunk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to put little things like that in there. What people, you know, what people were eating and is uh, kind of, it's something that I, I just like to, when I come across it, a reference to it, I always like to throw that in there just to make people realize, what, what the heck's going on? Yeah, they said that it, it didn't taste that bad, kind of like chicken, sort of like oh, everything. Oh, like everything tastes chicken, like chicken. But, but it, but it was ruined a bit by a faint essence of skunkiness. You know? I would think so. I just thought that's, a, that's hilarious. I mean, I wouldn't, unless I was starving, I don't, wouldn't really uh, go for the skunk myself. No. But uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. so, and uh, Stephen, uh, just uh, before we go again, um, Dominion is this book. Do you have another project in mind already? I do. Um, it's. I want to continue the story. And uh, and just uh, explore what happened once the railway was built, you know, and that would include the settlement of the prairies and the construction of the national parks and the tourism, as well as um, just how how did the land change once there was a giant railway connecting the east all the way to the west? What happened? What was the next story? So I was I was thinking almost like the third book in the Canadian Foundation series is what i would imagine it as and i haven't started it yet it'll be it'll be a while but you know yeah. the creation of the railway opened up another chapter of extreme dynamic change so i think as a society if we don't have some kind of evidence like fact-based uh nuanced foundation of understanding some of these formative periods in our history there's no possible way that we're ever going to come to any kind of reasonable accommodation and understanding of the world that we live in now. H history doesn't just end the day after things happen. It extends well, well into the future. And so that's kind of my objective, is to provide that foundation where I try to look at things from multiple points of view and give an honest assessment of it that's free of, you know, ideologies or free of... Uh, jingoism and not trying to push an agenda just to explore what the land looked like great well we look forward to that one as well so we'll probably chat with you in a in a while when that's available but again thank you very much for your time talking about dominion today thank you oh my pleasure bye for now thank you for visiting with us today this is talking books and stuff with dennis rimmer Contact him at Dennis at TalkingBooks.tk. Thank you, and may all the good news be yours. Oh, and don't forget to check out his book, The Great Canadian Notebook, available across Canada and at Amazon.ca. Oh, 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 oh.